The Owls did not end their season how or when they wanted to in more ways than one. It was a whirlwind of a holiday week from a COVID-19 delay to a COVID-19 cancellation. The story of the end of the season takes place off of the gridiron. You're tuned into the final edition of Inside the Nest in 2020. We're back from our holiday break and ITN starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome into another edition of Inside the Nest. Joined by Dom Gillespie and Adam Cornelli, I'm Ray Dunn. It was a jam-packed holiday break with football news, but none of it was on the good side. Temple was scheduled to finish its season with two home games at the link against ECU and Cincinnati. It sounds simple, right? But those two weeks were anything but simple. Just days before Temple was set to cap off its season, the Cincinnati Bearcats were slated to come to Philadelphia for what was almost sure to be Temple's last game of the year. It was billed as Senior Day in front of an empty stadium, but due to the growing concern around the coronavirus, the game was canceled. The news came on the heels of a serious outbreak on Temple's football team. According to Rod Carey, the team had 21 positive cases after testing on the Wednesday following the ECU game. The team's previous high for a day in testing was four. All in all, it was way too much for the team to overcome, putting the 2020 season in the history books. With more on the ending of the season, we bring our Inside the Nest beat reporter, Sage Hurley. Hey, Sage. Thanks, Ray. A late start, an early end, and one win in between. The Owls' 2020 season has come to a disappointing end. COVID-19 ended Temple's 1-6 season one game early. In many ways, the season couldn't have ended sooner for a program that had its first losing season since 2013. The entire season was a disappointment. We dealt with COVID, and quite frankly, guys, COVID won. Through the end of the season, we finally had 21 tests. Yes, 21 COVID-19 tests came back positive for the Owls on the Wednesday leading up to what would have been Temple's senior day game against Cincinnati. I've never been a part of a canceled game before in my life. I, I was downright right mad completely on the opposite end conflicting emotion was a complete sense of relief the guys were feeling that same thing this season was nothing short of chaotic temple started 40 different players with only five players starting all seven games one of which is receiver brandon mack he was even one of six to play quarterback for the owls this season amidst that chaos defensive end arnold ebicady had a standout season recording 42 tackles, four sacks, three forced fumbles, and one fumble recovery returned for a touchdown. And he did this all in just six games. I mean, that's playing at a high, high level. He has a lot of room to grow yet, too. Kamal Gray got to see the field for the first time as a walk-on freshman quarterback. I asked him after the game, do you ever think you'd play this year? He goes, uh, not really, coach. Coach Carey is looking forward to having a real offseason and is hoping to push spring ball to April 1st instead of the usual mid-March start date. I am glad we played. I am extremely upset at the outcomes, and we got to start the offseason uh, working toward those different results, and it starts in January. Edberg Olsen practice facility will be closed until a week from Wednesday due to COVID-19 protocol. After that, the team has one week together until Temple's official signing day. For the last time this semester, I'm Sage Hurley. Adam, back to you. Thanks, Sage. As we mentioned at the top of our show, the canceled game against Cincy wasn't the first straw of bad news. One week earlier, on November 21st to be exact, there was the calm before the storm against ECU. Temple was scheduled to play the Pirates for a 12 o'clock kickoff with freshman quarterback Matt Duncan making his first ever collegiate start, neither of which happened. It was announced about an hour before kickoff that Duncan was suspended indefinitely for violating team rules, which put freshman walk-on Kamal Gray under center. That's Temple's fifth quarterback at the start of the season, actually starting a game. Then, just minutes before kickoff, it was announced that the game would be delayed due to a potential COVID case in the Temple locker room. The game was delayed 50 minutes, and when the Owls took the field, they were without Christian Braswell, Kamir Brown, Arnold Abicady, George Reed, and Nate Wyatt. Each player was placed in COVID protocol, which meant even more new faces saw game action against ECU. The players re-emerged around 12.45 in the afternoon to get this game started. ECU's first drive stalls and they bring on Jake Verity for the field goal, but it is blocked by Evan Boozer to keep this one tied. 
A few drives later, Holton Nailers finds C.J. Johnson on the first play of the drive, 60 yards to the house, 7-0 Pirates. The next drive doesn't go so well for ECU. Ehlers fakes the handoff and has his pass batted into the air and intercepted by redshirt freshman Jordan McGee. The linebacker brings it inside the 20-yard line. The Owls are in business. They do not capitalize, however, only getting three points, compliments of Rory Bell. Now 7-3 Pirates. The very next play after the Bell field goal, the Owls make a big mistake and give the ball to Tyler Sneed. He'll field this one inside the 10, and he will do the rest. 95 yards on this kickoff return, add his 75 receiving yards, and a big punt return. Sneed had over 200 all-purpose yards on the day, along with his two touchdowns, a game the walk-on will not soon forget. The Pirates have the Owls scrambling early in the second quarter. ECU doing it on offense this time. Ehlers steps back. Remember I said two touchdowns for Sneeds? Yep, there it is. Some busted coverage gives them a clear path to the end zone as ECU continues to add to their lead. This one right here, just the cherry on top. Ehlers on the keeper to all but seal the deal for the Pirates in this one. 21 unanswered points from ECU and what was a fairly easy victory. 28-3 is the final score. There was clearly a serious need to stop Sneed. As Dom mentioned, Tyler Sneed was by far the most effective player on the field in this one. Sneed had 169 yards and a touchdown just on those punt and kickoff returns. And then you put that with the 75 yards he had receiving with that additional touchdown. And the sophomore went for 244 total yards to be exact with two touchdowns in the win. For the Owls, the numbers don't tell the full story of an impressive start by walk-on true freshman quarterback Kamal Gray. Given only three hours to prepare, it could have been disastrous. However, this is still the first time the Owls have not had a 100-yard passer in a game since the program's 43-7 loss against USF in 2017. As for the running game, Tavon Rooley had a few moments, but left in the first half with an injury that ended his year, even before the Cincy cancellation. Coming into this year, a lot of us would have considered ECU a very winnable game. But as Saturday fast approached, we realized that was not the case. With more on this, I'll toss it over to our beat reporter, Josh Shaffron. Talk to us, Josh. Thank you, Dom. And it's been an unusual football season, to say the least. And in a game where Brandon Mack took some reps at quarterback, it seemed as if everything that could go wrong did go wrong for the Owls and their loss to ECU. It was right here at Mitten Hall the week before Thanksgiving where Temple administered roughly 800 COVID tests per day. But on the Saturday before Thanksgiving, the football team was only concerned with one certain test. A positive test from a player's girlfriend delayed the start of this game for almost an hour. And due to COVID policies, that one positive test sent five key Temple players off the field and into COVID quarantine just moments before kickoff. Honestly, I, I didn't think we were going to play, and then got told we were going to play. We had, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five guys an hour before the game going to COVID protocol. Um, George Reed, Kristen Braswell, Camille Brown, Arnold, and uh, Nate Wyatt. We've used all the protocol at all different times. We had never discussed this event. And that wasn't the only last-minute discussion. Fourth-string quarterback Matt Duncan was still to start a QB all week but he was suspended just hours before game time for violating team rules. This left Coach Carey with one more quarterback, freshman walk-on Kamal Gray. I woke up for breakfast around 8.10, and I knew I had a meeting at 8.50, so I was getting ready to come down anyway, and I get a call. So I came down, and uh, it was Coach Harmon, Coach uh, Umovich, and Coach uh, Carey all in a room, and they kind of just told me that... Uh, I was starting. A dream come true for Kamal Gray to start a Division I college football game, but a nightmare for the coaching staff. Left with one healthy quarterback and backups at almost every other position. When you have one quarterback left on your roster, and different areas are so thin, um, you know, then it becomes a safety issue. So I, I've always said, and it, it has an effect. And, and that's my first job is to make sure that we're safe. And, now this certainly wasn't Coach Carey's first time voicing safety concerns. Carey said he wouldn't have played the final three games if the decision was up to him. And of course, Carey did get his wish in the season finale against Cincinnati. Instead of celebrating Senior Day versus the Bearcats, the Owls are left with that cancellation and a 1-6 season. They're worse since 2013. With Inside the Nest, I'm Josh Safran. Dom, back to you. Thank you so much, Josh. We're up against our first break of the day, but fret not, we have plenty more coverage on the other side.
When we come back, we'll try and break down everything that happened this season in just seven games. Inside the Nest, we'll be right back. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter. But this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. Yeah, it's certainly been a tough season to watch Temple football. Uh, numerous injuries, COVID protocols have definitely hindered this season, obviously, from beginning to end. I mean, let's break it down a little bit on what's been going on this season. First and foremost, I think none of us really saw, at least during this season, um, the rumors of Ray Davis potentially transferring before this season or, you know, heading into next season. I think we all kind of speculated it could happen, but who saw it happening midway through? I certainly didn't. That was definitely, a, you know, a negative downfall for Temple that we didn't see coming. Uh, Anthony Russo getting hurt, and then immediately right after he gets hurt, uh, you're expecting him to come back that coming up Saturday and then he gets put on the COVID protocol list and we never get to see Anthony Russo play again this season for Temple football. Um, IGM and Randall Jones both single digits both had solid performances when they were on the field but that's a key when they were on the field. Two hindered seasons yet again um, for both of them. Who knows if um, they'll be returning. I mean it was tough to watch both of them you know um, come out because they're both such competitive guys and they were great when they were on the field. And as far as the positive to wrap up at least for me um, Arnold Ebicati is a guy that we didn't talk a lot about heading into the year. Didn't really know what to expect. I know we mentioned Manny Walker. He was getting a lot of praise. But Arnold Ebicati really stole the show on the edge, on the outside. And um, honestly, frankly, guys, if I'm being honest, I think that if Ebicati doesn't come up with that scoop and score against USF, we could potentially talk, be talking about a team that didn't win a game this season. I, I don't know. It would have been tough, but that touchdown put him up, and the Owls only won the game by two. Yeah, you know, Adam going to hit on a lot of the same things. No one could have predicted what happened in the quarterback room. You mentioned Russo goes down, but then his backup, Beatty, comes in. He goes down. Then his backup, Real, goes down. Then Matt Duncan gets suspended. True freshman walk-on Kamal Gray is starting in the last game of the season for the Owls. Hats off to him. He did what he could. He had three hours to prepare. But still, no one could have predicted what happened in that quarterback room. The second half against ECU, Brandon Mack was taking serious snaps at quarterback. Serious snaps, no wildcat, two drives, Brandon Mack was the guy taking snaps. And then, you know, looking a little bit back into the season, we all know there was a little bit of passive play calling. The one that sticks out is against Navy, that two-point conversion. And then, you know, not going for it on fourth down in positive territory, especially with all the kicking troubles the Owls have had this year. And then, you know, the single digits never got going. You mentioned IGM and Randall Jones' injury. Amir Tyler and Christian Braswell played the whole year. Archibong and Maja, they played the whole year. But we didn't really see a lot of production from those guys. The ones that did play very, very well, as I already mentioned, Brandon Mack, best player on the team probably in my opinion. And Quenku was a bright spot too. Quenku got going a little later in the year. But all in all, I'm sure everyone involved is happy that the season is over. This season was organized chaos in, in every sense of the phrase. I mean, there was a few things that were good. There were some things that I liked. Adam Barry went from the worst punter in the conference to now the third best net average. He's eighth in the country in punting per game, which leads me to something that was bad. The offense throughout the season uh, obviously got a lot worse with the situation at quarterback and with the everything that was in flux there. But it was a tough year for them even just to get started and get going through everything. Another thing that I thought was pretty good, I think Jeff Knowles did a good job of getting young guys to play hard on defense. I think they had a lot of success in the first half. You saw them wear out the second half, just not enough experience for them to really hold a full game. But I think that was a good part. But I think something bad and something that's really focused for this program going forward is a lot of AAC programs either kept their space at the top of the conference or took a step forward as Temple took a step back. And that's where I think when you look at everything wholesale, that's where my concern would be is, is not so much picking apart every little thing that went wrong, but how do you look nationally? How do you look in this conference to potential people that want to play here? And Rod Carey spoke to a little bit of that in a very candid close to the season. Rod Carey said that COVID-19 defeated the Owls. Beyond that, the head coach reflected on a wide range of topics and braced himself for what will be another unusual offseason. Let's take a listen. We dealt with COVID, and quite frankly, guys, COVID, you know, won <laughs> in a lot of respects. From, um, uh, you know, the start of 
the restrictions uh, through the end of the season when we finally had 21 tests. Uh, you know, I, I've never been a part of a canceled game before in my life. I, I was downright mad because I wanted to go compete. Um, and then the other completely on the opposite end conflicting emotion was a complete sense of relief. And uh, when I met with him on Wednesday, uh, you know, out on the field, out there to tell them, I know there was a lot of shock and then I'm sure they progressed into both those feelings as well. It's so like I've said, you can do things right with COVID and get it. And you can do things wrong with COVID and not get it. So uh, certainly felt like our team, our staff, our administration, uh, all of us were trying to do exactly what we needed to do to get on the field. And we did, we got on the field. So with that, you can consider a success Obviously, the results were highly disappointing. Special teams was probably a disappointment um, through the course of the year, minus the punt team, uh, that, you know, it just did not, you know, we were as simple as we could be, and it, we couldn't get that part done. So we'll, we'll effort to get that done, uh, you know, starting here today. I'll get it started here. I will give him, in my opinion, a pretty generous C minus. I mean, when you look back at the season as a whole, one win and the other, only other game they even had a shot in was week one against Navy. So not being able to even compete in most of the games this year. I mean, most of us had them around the three, four win margin. The fact they only competed in two really raises a red flag to me. The play calling was passive in certain situations. I know Ray's a fan of going for it on fourth down when you're in favorable territory. Rod Carey doesn't seem to like to do that. He likes to take the points, which in some situations is good, but in some games, like like Memphis when you're going up against a really good offense you know you got to take them shots and try to hang with them you know he didn't really want to take those chances and you know later in the season everyone was played by injuries you got to rally your guys to come and play in games and I just don't think he does that I don't think anyone on the coaching staff really had had that this season but you know a lot of injuries and you know a lot of young guys getting playing time it's hard to say the season will have an asterisk next to it do I think Carrie should lose his job no but C minus for me all right all right Things working against them. Hand a schedule that won over two thirds of its games a year ago, and two of the teams that Temple saw, Tulane and ECU, both improved from where they were a year ago, where they were either mediocre or bad. They couldn't get full practices until September. They played without their starting quarterback for four games, and then they went through the entire quarterback depth in those four games. They were down nearly 30 players in each of the last three weeks, they were handed what looks like an almost impossible scenario, and clearly the results show it. When they go back, I'm not, this is not, again, apologizing. I'm giving them a B minus because I think when you look at all those things, given what they were offered and what they put out on the field, they were competitive in the first half of games, which again, is a moral victory. But when you have young guys who aren't, aren't used to playing that full 60 minutes, having them competitive for any part of the game against the talent level of the AAC is impressive. I mean, again, there's things not to like. They didn't seem prepared for the start of the season against Navy. They had a lot of questionable play calling, Dom, you got to that. And they struggled to put together anything that assembled a clicking team all at once. So it's not it's not me saying, hey, they did, they did a great job of this year, but they were dealt an impossible hand, B minus. Yeah, it was absolutely strange. We can all agree that. I mean, look look what we're doing right now. We're, we're in our homes because of uh, the pandemic going on. I'm recording this and still giving you guys uh, the updates and our opinions. Um, for me, my opinion on this season, I give it a solid C. Um, I'll go right in between you guys. I think predictable play calling was the theme for me. Um, like Dom mentioned, um, and we've mentioned, uh, the injuries and COVID concerns took out a bunch of key players. Um, but it's college football, and there's so many guys that are looking to make a name for themselves. And it's hard to do that um, when the play calls are so predictable that even we can predict them watching from the sidelines or in the press box or wherever the game may be. Um, you know, the, the play calling at times was very, very predictable. Um, questioning play calls was another thing. I was, we mentioned the Navy game. Temple has a shot to tie the game with a two-point conversion late. And we, we know from the post-game press conference, um, Rod Carey had a lack of trust in his offensive coordinator. Um, he overruled the play call and it didn't work out. And he kind of chuckled after the post game in that game saying, uh, we'd probably be saying a different story if it worked. And he was kind of just laughing that it just didn't go his way and it was his call. Um, like that's kind of concerning that you're making the call over your offensive coordinator in a, in 
like literally the game. The, the play was that game. They had to convert that two-point conversion. One and six record speaks for itself. I mean, it's a very tough schedule that Temple had this season. And we mentioned a lot of programs are going upwards or staying at the top, not going downwards like Temple did. And obviously with COVID and injuries, th this really plagued the season for Temple. Great block of content from the three of us. What else is new? But unfortunately, the last break of the show is hot on our tails. That's right. When we come back, we'll do one last edition of No Huddle for the semester. And we'll recap the AAC and what's been going on with a nationally ranked team. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi. Hi. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water, too. That'll probably help. You were probably going to turn down the radio, too, so you could focus, right? Probably OK isn't OK. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on him. There's two weeks left in the AAC football schedule, technically in the regular season. Um, the only teams that can really catch Tulsa for that number two spot is uh, Memphis. Um, but when it comes to the AAC championship game, does either of that really matter? Because we're talking about the nationally ranked number seven overall, Cincinnati Bearcats. Guys, what do you think? I mean, for me, I'm thinking it's Cincy all the way. Oh, it's Cincy all the way. Desmond Ritter, Jared Dokes, that running game, combined with that incredible defense, controls games, just absolutely runs teams out of the stadium. They're fifth in the nation, allowing only 15 points per game. They're winning by an average of 25 points per game. You're looking at a 2017 UCF level of dominance that's leaving this entire conference in the dust. Let's start talking nationally. Let's talk about that college football playoff, huh? I'm with you on that one, Ray. They're just a very well-coached team. Luke Fickle is in, in a couple seasons at Cincinnati, and he's really making a name for himself in that program. I mean, their secondary is honestly best in the nation right now. They've only let up four passing touchdowns this season, and they have they also lead the nation in interceptions. So, you know, the defense as a whole is a bright spot, and they have Desmond Ritter, too, who's been playing a lot, a lot of good football. Um, no team in the conference really holds a candle with them. UCF was the closest. They only lost to them by three points, but that's also Cincinnati, you know, just sat on the ball on the goal line. They could have easily won that game by 10 points if they they wanted to so it's Cincinnati all the way here we go one last time it's the best five minutes of our week that's right no huddle is back to wrap up the season of Temple football and this season of inside the nest it's time for that final edition of no huddle like Dom just said and mr. Dunn deal has that uh, it's putting us in the hot seat. Ray Dunn, take it away, buddy. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's get this one started. Big picture. Let's talk positives for a second here. What was the biggest bright spot of this Temple football season for you guys? Dom, I'll start with you. Um, bright spot this season has to be Brandon Mack. I mean, obviously, there's, he's probably going to go to the draft or transfer to another school, if I'm being honest. I don't see Brandon Mack coming back and playing for Temple football, but he has to be the overall bright spot. I mean, he's just an all-around complete receiver. Even with the quarterback struggles, he still managed a way to, you know, get involved in the pass game, get some touchdowns and get some yards and some tough games. So I think Mack has to be the bright spot at the end of the day. Yeah, for me, short and sweet. I mentioned it earlier, so I'll keep it short and sweet. Arnold Abacady, I think that he was a really big bright spot, a guy that really came onto the scene, helped Temple get that one win this season. Uh, definitely Arnold Abacady. I'm going Adam Barry, but I mentioned that earlier. Now, I don't want to open up a can of worms here, so please excuse me. You have to pick one, all right? We're not going for lists here. The biggest disappointment from this football season. Adam, we're starting with you. Come on, right? Um, I guess the biggest disappointment, right? That was the word. Um, injuries. I, I think if I'm going to be honest, like losing IGM, he was going to be such a key to keeping that defense intact, losing him right away and the injuries that followed, but especially IGM, if I had to name one specific injury of the injuries, IGM, that was huge. <laughs> a lot of big picture questions from you here, Ray. Um, biggest disappointment this year, um, I think it's, it all circles back to uh, Rod Carey. Um, you know, the play calling needs to be better in certain situations. I mean, obviously, biggest picture, Adam already mentioned it, is injuries. But if we're going to pick apart, you know, one thing, it has to be the play calling. It has to be the head coaching. Even if, you da if you're down, guys, you got to find a way to go out there and compete and try to win games. And you didn't really do that after week two. So it has to be that for me. I'm most disappointed in us. Nobody came anywhere close to getting their preseason record 
Raptors, right? That's an, an absolute shame on all of our parts. And one final question. It's a bit of a senior day for the two of you. You guys have covered this team for a couple of years now. Give me your favorite maybe game, moment, or show that you've had while covering this football team. Dom, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, so I was the Inside the Nest reporter last year, so I did have a hand in a lot of those shows. Ray Dunn, my co-reporter in that aspect. Let's see. So my favorite game probably has to be the game where Temple upset Memphis last year. Um, it was a really questionable call at the end of the game, but um, ranked Memphis came to the link and Temple took it to them. You know, they, they went out there and won the football game. And um, I was really happy to see that, happy to see a big upset. They upset Maryland earlier in that season, too. I thought Temple should have been ranked for a little bit of last season. It was a lot of fun to cover, but it has to be the Memphis game if I have to pick one. Yeah, um, for, <laughs> Ray, Ray remembers this. Uh, I'd say that Maryland game. I remember being on a show with Ray and I said, that week that they were going to win that game, the Temple was going to win uh, and upset Maryland in that game. I believe Maryland was ranked at the time. Um, that that defense, that team was so fun to watch last year, um, which is why they set a record for how many guys entered the NFL that we've been talking about throughout the season. And there's a bunch of names that we didn't even mention that are also playing in the NFL around the league. Chappelle Russell's a guy we didn't really mention. Sean Bradley, we didn't touch on a lot, but he's playing over at the link as well with the Eagles. A lot of uh, snaps on special teams. Uh, that team was really fun. Maryland last year, uh, it was a great game to be at. Very fun. Very fun to be at. Well, Thank you, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure working with to you, and that's going to do it for our final edition of Inside the Nest. Now, before I turn over to both of you to say your goodbyes, I want to make sure I thank everyone who had a hand in this, so bear with me real quick. Our two incredible beat reporters, Sage Hurley and Josh Safran, the wonderful workers behind the scenes in Jake Jessberger, Jimmy Tui, and Bella Diamore, the best graphics guy in the game, Ben Zimmerman, our amazing and tireless producer, Nate McWilliams, and of course, our executive producer, Matt Fine, who makes this all possible. But to you wonderful guys, it has been an absolute pleasure. You make every week fun. It's been a weird semester, a strange semester, but I can count on you guys bringing it every week. Yeah, Ray took the time to thank everyone behind the scenes. I want to give thanks to you guys. You know, it was a very, lot of uncertainty leading up to this year. We didn't even know if this show was going to happen two weeks before the even season even started. And we all just hopped on a call. We said we wanted to make this happen, and we did. Um, every week, we found a way to make good content. 11 weeks, I came in here. I had fun with both of you guys. Um, I'm honestly proud, given the circumstances we had, of the content we put out and the time I've spent with you guys. And I can say with a lot of confidence that the future is bright for you two guys. Um, yeah, it's always been my dream uh, to do this show since I stepped on the Temple's campus. Did I think it was going to take place virtually during a pandemic? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, but I can't thank all of you guys enough, everybody that you guys just mentioned, uh, for making this dream come true. Uh, we may be separated next semester on our shows, but when you think about it, we've technically been separated this semester, and I still consider each and every one of you guys family. Um, the guys that aren't on this call that work behind the scenes, and girl, um, girls, girls. Uh, Everybody, just such a great experience. Um, for Dom Gillespie, Ray Dunn, and our entire Inside the Nest crew here in 2020, I'm Adam Cornally. Real quick to our viewers, thank you so much for watching each and every week on our content. And until next time, please stay safe, and we'll talk to you in the new year in 2021.